Hey, if we've not met, my name's Eric. I'm part of the teaching team here at Journey Church. And a number of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to help open up this series in the book of Acts. And today I'm charged with closing out this series in the book of Acts. Have you guys enjoyed it so far for those of you who have been here? Hey, if you're a first-time guest, thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us today. We are excited that you're here. Um, as we get into this book today, it's, you know, I, I just love the book of Acts. I don't know about you. It's an amazing story about the early church and what it looked like and what the people did in those early days of the lives of Christianity. And in that very first week, I said, um, even though the book of God, the canon of God is finished, it is written, right? The story of God, the grand story of God continues to be written in our own generation, right? Through you and I, believers in Jesus Christ, God's story is still being written in our generation. So I would ask from the beginning, what is your story going to look like? You know, there's going to be a chapter in there somewhere about you and I, right? Now, I don't know about you, forgive me, Lord, but there's a couple sections of Scripture that are kind of boring. None of you are willing to admit that. You know the parts where it says so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. Have you ever read that particular part? How many of you are honest you kind of skip over that part when you get to there, right? But how cool would it be if your name was actually in there, right? That would be really, really cool. So... There's other sections that are, are kind of crazy. Some things tell you what you should do. Other parts tell you what you shouldn't do, right? So um, this morning I was reading in Scripture about the end of Saul. And Saul, um, you know, didn't have a very good ending. It said in the very last chapter there about his life that he had strayed from God and that he no longer sought after him. And in fact, he had led other people in many ways to do the same. And he finds himself out on the battlefield, and God's favor has already left him. His sons had died, and he knows it. He ends up being injured, and then he impales himself on a sword to kill himself. So there's some high drama up there in, in the Bible too, right? Let's not have that particular section be written about you, right? So some of you are here, and up to this point in your life, I know mine was certainly the same, um, if I were reading it, there's certain sections of scripture that are like what not to do with your life, right? But the beauty is that if you're still living, if there's still breath in your bones, your story can change. It can be one of those transformation stories that we see in the Bible about how someone was walking in one direction and then they encountered God and then all of a sudden everything was different about their life. Those are the stories that I love to read. And man, the book of Acts is replete with those kinds of stories. When we opened up this series back in June 6th, I was reminded of a few things. That particular day, there were some amazing things that happened. It happened to be Pentecost Sunday. And God poured out the Holy Spirit on the church and the church was born. And this guy named Peter, who formerly was called a reed shaking in the wind, is what Simon reads, is what the name Simon stands for. So this guy, Simon, who's a reed shaking in the wind, all of a sudden goes out there under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit and begins to preach the gospel. Thousands of people get saved, it says. How crazy is that? He was once a fisherman seemingly living this quaint life who's a reed shaking in the wind and all of a sudden, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he's willing to go out there and preach to thousands and see thousands get saved. An amazing story of God. We see in Scripture in the book of Acts people being healed, financial needs being met, a unique God-inspired community begin to touch them all. What we're witnessing all along is God's people, the people of the way, were a people who were living on mission. Their mission, the primary purpose of their life once they got saved, was to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And they took that call on their lives very seriously. And I hope as you've read them that their stories would inspire our faith and our God-given mission to continue to thrive in our own generation. You see, we've talked about here a lot at Journey Church that we find ourselves in a cosmic battle that's been going on for all the ages. We're in the midst of it, whether you want to believe it or not. God has a role for you to play. 
He wants you to continue to use your life to spread the good news of the gospel in our own generation. And if you're here today and you feel a bit calloused, if you're here today and you feel a bit burned out, I'm praying that God will use this morning to renew your faith and get you back into the heart of the battle because our job is to be disciples who make disciples until Jesus returns. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for the book of Acts and the stories that we read. Father, we thank you that they can serve as amazing inspiration for us. At times, they can serve as cautionary tales of what not to do. But Lord, we realize that in our own strength, we can do nothing. But when empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can be world changers like those 12 disciples who followed you and changed the world. Lord, we want to continue your work in our generation. We want to be about our Father's business. We want to hear Well done, my good and faithful servant. So, Father, today, would you inspire us? And if there be anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, would you draw them into your presence today? Would they surrender their life to you and start a new journey as a member of God's family? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. A few questions came to mind when I began to reflect deeply on the implications of what we've been reading. What are the implications of these scriptures for us personally? Lord, what are you asking me to do? How should the things that I'm reading and experiencing through the book of Acts change the way in which I'm living? Are there things that I need to repent from? Are there other things that I need to do more of? Is this a call to advance in our generation? And how does it impact the church as a whole as well? It's not just about me. It's about God first and foremost. It's his story, not your story, right? It's his story and he allows us to be a part of it. And one of the big things that I see in the book of Acts is what the early church looked like. Remember, ultimately the church is you and I, right? You and I are the church wherever we find ourselves. What did the disciples do that ultimately continues on into our day? What did that group of 12 men who were followers of Jesus under the power of the Holy Spirit do that literally changed the world? Journey, I have to remind you yet from the beginning here, I can't underscore enough that God wants to use you to continue to change the world. You might say, Eric, why would he want to use me? And maybe that's the truth right now. But if you'll submit to him, if you'll repent, if you'll seek God, if you'll put him first, I assure you, he wants to use you to change the world. There are so many lost and hurting people around us that he wants to touch. And it's not going to happen unless you and I live out the book of Acts in our everyday lives. He has a purpose and a mission and a calling on your life. The purpose is a high calling that the devil wants to keep you from. He wants to keep you broke, busted, and disgusted. He wants to keep you complacent. He wants to keep you from fulfilling what God has called you to. And sometimes he'll even use comfort to do that. He likes you to be comfortable. Yet there is nothing, absolutely nothing more important than fulfilling the the call that God has placed on your life. That you might get to heaven and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, so many in our generation are walking around like zombies. And I saw some videos of people on the drug addicted streets and it happens right here. Have you seen it around here? When you go around Blanding Boulevard, when you go around any of the places, there's people literally like walking around like zombies if you go to the gas station. God has called you to help bring them back to life in Jesus' name. He wants to use people like you to go wake them up. You might ask, Eric, what's my mission? What's my calling? We'll explore a little bit of that today. To find out our mission, let's roll back the clock to just before the book of Acts opens up. What were Jesus' final words to his followers? After he had risen from the dead, I had to stop there for a minute and almost just say, wow. 
I literally, when I wrote it down, I just had to stop because I was going to take it like, hey, after he risen from the dead, let's go. Go on to the next verse. Let's go. Do, could you imagine after he had risen from the dead? Think about that for a moment. Don't gloss it over again for just a second. Our king rose from the dead, giving us hope that you and I will rise from the dead to join him in heaven one day. That is no small statement. He's speaking these words after he had died, after he had been in the grave, and then he comes back to life. And these are the words of most importance to him that he's sharing with his disciples before he ascends to go back to heaven. How crazy is that? Matthew 28, 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain on which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. We know that as the great commission, right? So what we call it in Christianity, he commissioned them. But this is the big general purpose of the church corporately, but also your and I's lives. So I don't have a great deal of time to talk about calling today, but that's the unique way in which he has gifted you to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But may I assure you that there's nothing more important in your life than fulfilling the great commission and the great commandment. That is the call on your life. Other things will try to get in the way. We'll talk about that for a moment. So our mission as believers, is to be disciples who make disciples. Now, there's a prerequisite here. You can't give away what you don't have. Think about that for a minute. You can't give away what you don't have. I was sharing with somebody earlier, one of my favorite statements from AA is, if you want what we have, you will go to any length to get it. What does that mean? I think they do evangelism better than the church often, right? If you're walking in it, if people see something different about you, if you're experiencing the joy of the Lord and manifesting the fruits of the Spirit, let me tell you, you don't have to preach the gospel with a bunch of words. You don't have to take out advertisements to get people to come to church. When you're walking in it, all of a sudden, some people will be drawn to you. They're going to see something in you that they want, And if they really want that Jesus in you, they're going to go to any length to get it, right? Think about your own life. I know that was me when I got saved. Once I really experienced real Jesus inside of people, you couldn't keep me away from church. You couldn't keep me away from church. Man, I wanted what they had, and boy, I was willing to go to any length to get it. Maybe that's your experience as well. But it begs the question, what is a disciple? I'd give it the following definition. A disciple is a follower of Jesus that is empowered by the Holy Spirit who lives a life of worship in community and on mission. Let's break that down for a moment. A follower of Jesus is one who surrendered their life to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Their life is no longer their own. One who was once a slave to sin is now a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We're filled with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit when we get saved. Sometimes we got to do a little bit more work to help manifest that. Lord, give us more of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He will not leave you disappointed. Everyone lives a life of worship, whether they're willing to admit it or not. We all worship something. We're wired for it. You see it out there in the world, do you not? Some worship money. Some worship sex. Some worship their health. Some worship their jobs. We all worship something, right? And the enticements of the world and these created things can have a heavy influence on our lives, even as believers in Jesus Christ. If we allow those things as believers to become idols in our life, that's not a good thing, right? What's an idol? Anything that tries to take preeminence in the first place in your life over and above your relationship with Jesus Christ. 
You got to war against the idols that you have in your life. And let me tell you, if you do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will overcome no matter how big those strongholds are. God will set you free. He is a jealous God who is worthy to be worshiped, praised, honored, and adored. Can I get an amen? Community, I want to dive into that. So we talked about a worshiper who lives in community and lives on mission or some of those characteristics. Community to me is twofold. There's the Christian community, the koinonia fellowship that is uniquely empowered and inspired by the Holy Spirit where believers in Jesus Christ get together like we did this morning and we worship God in community and something special happens that you generally cannot recreate at your house, right? I mean, I listen to worship music. That's the only place that I'll sing out loud is when I'm at home, right? Because I don't want to scare you all away. I want you to come back to church. We want it to be that way. If I sing, you're going to go. If if they want you to leave at the end of the service, I'll start singing to get everybody to head out of here real quick, right? That's where I can create a joyful noise by myself. But isn't there something special and spectacular when a group of people gathers together to worship God in community with one another? There's an energy that's there that just isn't recreated anywhere else. That's a beautiful thing that we get to experience, but it extends beyond that, right? into like small groups with other believers and your friend group that you have. And you should be a part of this community of believers if God has called you here. This is God's family, Journey Church. We're not exclusive. There's other great churches all around Jacksonville and all around the world, right? But what tends to happen is God plants us in a particular family, right? And then when he does, then guess what? You should go all in on that. Don't be a stranger. Don't be hiding out in the corner. Don't like, yeah, you guys who are in the back row, I see you back there. You're going to jump in, jump. I know, I know what you're doing. Come on. Next week, they're like, I'm not sitting in the back row. No, I can't see you. It's fine. The lights are bright up here. I don't see who you are. Um, but don't be a stranger. Plug in. Serve. Be a part of the body of Christ. My, my kids are not here for this one, right? So I'll be able to say this this service. You know, we, we had a rule around our house, like if Mary Jo cooks, then I generally clean, right? And then if the kids come over, you would hope that they would like help follow those rules. Like if we cook, they would clean. But sometimes that don't happen. And that's kind of like frustrating, right? Like they ain't pulling their weight in the house. If you're here every week consuming and you ain't serving, you ain't pulling your weight in the house. And I'm calling you out right now in Jesus' name. And why do I call you out? Because there's something beautiful in serving that you're missing out on if you don't do it. I don't do it to add some more burden to you. Another thing, oh man, I have to go to church. If you have to go to church, this ain't the church you should be going to. Go somewhere else. Find the place that God's called you to plug in where you're like, I get to go to church today, man. I am fired up. You see, Adrian, if half of that would rub on, off on all of us, we'd be fired up. I mean, come on, Jesus, right? But our hope is that it's a want to, it's a get to, like I want to be here, that church is not a have to be here, like I don't want to miss, right? And then there's those times where you need a little bit more intimate community too, those moments where you really should plug into something like a small group where you can get to know other people and hold one another accountable or where you make friendships inside the church that you can have those loving relationships with other people where you could grow as iron sharpens iron. So community is essential in the life of a believer. Now I said there's a twofold expression of that. Um, That means that also, guess what? You should have a whole bunch of friends that are not Christians as well. Not just with a target on their back, like, hey, I wanna see them become a Christian but deep within that you might live it out before them because if all of your friends and all of your circle of influence is 100% Christian, then guess what? That means we're not fulfilling the Great Commission, right? There has to be people in your life that you're close enough to that you could share the good news of the gospel with. And sometimes for many of us, that has to happen intentionally. 
We need to think about that. It needs to be about a part of who it is because the danger in Christianity is it becomes us four and no more. We have our happy huddle where we gather together on Sunday mornings and we worship together and then we go about our lives and we don't know anybody outside who needs to get saved. And guess what? That's the surest recipe for the church to die, right? You need to go out there and intentionally develop relationships with other people that are far from God with the hope that they will know God. But you also need to have some wisdom in that. Like, you know, if you have a drinking problem, don't go to the bar once you get saved to go minister to the people at the bar. Do you hear what I'm saying? You got to have some strength and understanding in who you are and where you're at in your faith. So it's oftentimes easier to be pulled back down than it is to help pull people up, right? So you got to use wisdom in that. And boy, have I strayed from my message. Come on, Jesus. Keep it. So I believe in many cases, I think you have to earn the right to share the message with somebody. What do I mean by that? I go back to my concept earlier. Do people want what you have? So when they look at you, let me ask a series of questions. Do you look just like the world? Or is there something different about you? Do your coworkers want to know Jesus because they see you giving it your all at work as an act of worship to your God? Do they see peace in you? Do they see the power of the Holy Spirit being manifested in and through your life? Do they see the fruits of the Spirit being manifested in your life? Or are you living just like the world? If you are, why would they want what you have? Why would they want to hear what you have to say? The sad truth is they're probably looking at you and saying, that person's a Christian on Sunday, but they're a hypocrite on Monday. That's not how we're called to live. Let it not be so amongst the people of Journey Church. Can I get an amen? There's a call to holiness. There's a call to right living. There's a call to right loving. And we need to catch ourselves when we're not doing the things that line up with the Spirit of God so that we could change. It's called repenting, right? If they see something different in you, they will go to any link to get it. The sad fact in our generation is many Christians do not have much of a chance to share the message because if you looked at them at work or you looked at them on the playground or you looked at them in the neighborhood, you wouldn't know by looking at them that they're Christians. That's a sad reality in our generation, but guess what? We can change it. Church, we have to live differently. We have to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We have to renounce sin and live holy lives. We have to have the word deeply embedded within us, ready to come out in season and out of season. We have to reflect Jesus well in every area of our lives. But Eric, I often fall short. Guess what? We all do. You have issues. How many of you have issues? The rest of you that didn't raise your hand really have issues. (laughs) I've got issues. You've got issues. God does not call us to be perfect. But guess what, man? Even if, if if you screw up in front of your friends, but you go out there and you fess up in this generation, that means a lot to people. And I messed up. I blew it. There's nothing wrong with saying that. One other thing, just to reiterate that community, you were not created to do this alone. Jesus promised in that scripture that he would never leave us or forsake us and that we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You are supernaturally empowered by the spirit of the living God in your life to overcome all things. He is your teacher, your guide, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. Rely and lean in on the Holy Spirit and ask for his advice. Welcome him into your life. Scripture says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, but he's praying and interceding for you. You are not in this alone. And if you add to that the community of believers that's here at Journey Church surrounding you, if you'll plug in, if you'll let them know who you are, if you'll get connected, if you'll share the good things in your life as well as the challenges in your life, guess what? They'll rally around you because they love you and they want to see you succeed and they're here to lift you up and not pull you down. Would you plug in and become a part of this great family of believers? One more scripture to share and then I'm going to dive a little bit into the book of Acts to close it out. So 
a mission and a message is where I started. The message is always the gospel, creation, fall, rescue, restoration in some way, somehow, some shape, some form. Jesus frames it in his last words as depicted by Luke in this way, Luke 24, 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture and he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my father to you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The disciples were a people with a mission, they were a people with a message, and they were people that were anointed by the very spirit of the living God to go out and change the world. Nothing about that has changed. Do you see yourself in that light? Do you need to remind yourself today that the Holy Spirit is with you, that he will help you overcome even the darkest things that might be going through your mind that you're like right now, Eric, I'll never be able to overcome this. Let me tell you, you can overcome it by the power of the living God in your life. I assure you, God can change you. He can deliver you. He can set you free. He wants you to be successful. He wants your story to be an amazing story that other people look back and read. It's called your testimony, right? So he does it in our lives, but he also does it in community that the lives of others might be transformed as well. Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The promise is being fulfilled. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I say this and reiterate this verse from the first week that we gathered together in Acts just to remind you that God's promises will be fulfilled. He loves you. You can trust him. He will never leave you or forsake you. No matter how tough things might feel, he loves you. He cares for you. Hallelujah. Peter was filled and preached and saw amazing things happen. We can be filled with the Spirit and live as disciples who make disciples and see amazing things happen in our generation. Think about when that happens individually, but what happens when it happens as a community of believers? How crazy is this? The life set of verses that we've been reading all along, let me read them one last time. Acts 2.42, this is what disciples did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And all who believed together had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved saved. That's the kind of church that I want to be a member of. I don't know about you. That's the kind of church that I want to be a member of. It's not about the lights. It's not about the smoke and haze machines. It's not about the amazingly gorgeous, wonderful pastor that used to be here as the founding pastor back in the day. (laughs) It's not about that, right? (laughs) It's not about people. It's not about personalities. It's about pointing to the one who saved us, the one who loved us, the one who died that we might have life. And let me tell you something. Community is a very strong thing. What do I mean by that? Everybody is longing for community and it often makes up a huge part of their identity. You know, Mary Jo and I went to uh, take a week of vacation. We stayed by Daytona Beach this past week. The big thing that's the big identity thing down there is the racetrack and the biker community, right? Every bar down there, I didn't go in any of them, come on Jesus, but we drove down that main street and every bar was like a biker bar, right? 
so many people find community in like the biker community. I mean, that is like a subculture and everything's a subculture in our life um, that people want to be a part of. They're drawn to it because they find some sense of identity and community within it. I believe God places a longing for community in our heart. You know, think about athletics. People rally around teams, right? Some of you like the Jaguars. I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong with you people. Um, Gators fans, even worse. Come on, Jesus. Come on. You know I tease. Come on. Come on now. But think about, look at the reaction, how strong that was to that sense of community, that sense like that people long to be a part of something, right? Right? I think they'll keep searching over and over and over again, ultimately longing to be a part of the community and family of God. That's what they ultimately need. So they try to fill it with all of these other things until they could find real community and real family inside of the body of Christ. That's why it's imperative and so important that we do invite unbelievers to church, that we invite them into our small groups, that we invite them into our lives so that they could get a glimpse of who Jesus is with the hope that it would change them and transform them and continue to grow the family of God until he returns. Would we be about our father's business? Would we be about our father's mission Would you be about living out your calling? And if you don't know what that is, I encourage you to go to Growth Track. What a great place to start. You could be a believer for 20 years and you're still like, Eric, I don't know what I'm called to do. Guess what? There's no shame in the game at all. Go back to the basics. Go back to the beginning. The Lord will restore the joy of your salvation if you will only let him. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Lord, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to preach your word. Father, I only hope that people saw more of you in this message than they did of me, for sure, Lord God. I pray that you use the book of Acts to do the work that only you could do. Lord, as we gaze upon that amazing community of believers and what they did, may it inspire us in our own generation to continue to do the same to be an Acts chapter two kind of church in our generation. It was a haven and a community that was oppressed. It was a haven and a season where the Roman empire was overtaking and enslaving and crucifying people.